Welcome uh, to the BakerBots Corporate Series uh, Overview of General Partner IPOs. Uh, my name is Molly Duckworth. I'm a corporate uh, partner here in, uh, at BakerBots, and I am joined by Mike Bresson, who is a tax partner and head of our MLP tax practice, uh, and Nelson Mabry um, of Barclays, um, who is a director um, in the investment making division at Barclays. And um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction um, of the webinar that we have going on today. Welcome for those of you who are listening to us um, online um, and give a couple of uh, opening remarks and then we will get started. Um, so for any questions that you have during the program, um, you can send an email to Andrew Scott, uh, whose email is andrew.scott, that's S-C-O-T-T, -T, at bakerbots.com, uh, and we can answer any of those questions at the end of the, of the program. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, the, this program does qualify for 0.7 hours of uh, Texas, California, and New York CLE credit. Uh, for those of you that are attorneys on the line, um, we will give a number um, that you will need for an affirmation form um, at the last or during the last 15 minutes of the program. So make sure to listen for that number. Um, and finally, a recording of the webinar will be circulated in the next 24 hours and will also be posted to our firm's website at www.bakerbots.com. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Um, one quick introduction uh, is that you know, this is the first in what we hope to be an ongoing corporate series um, to cover um, various corporate legal topics that are relevant. Um, and so we are hoping to be coming to you around once a month um, with different topics. Um, so look forward to, uh, to seeing you all for future, future meetings as well. So our agenda for today, um, we are going to you know, really just touch at a high level um, about what general, IP, general partner IPOs um, are, what are some of the kind of principal tax and legal uh, considerations, and, and really a lot around the structuring. That's our, our experience with, um, with general partner IPOs recently. We've seen that you know, more so than, than other IPOs, there's a tremendous amount of focus on how to structure the entity and how to uh, plan ahead um, for the, the way that the entity will be set up and, and really maximize the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sponsor entity's goals <coughs> with actually having a separate IPO for their general partner. And so we're going to really touch on some of those, um, those from both a legal and a tax side, um, and then Nelson will be able to give us um, his perspective on the banking side as well. Um, once we've had a chance to go through you know, some of these legal and tax considerations, Nelson's going to focus a little bit about um, precedent. So what, what have we actually seen in the market? What have people done? Um, and how to, you know, how to look at, from a marketing and valuation side, um, a general partner IPO. And then we'll wrap up with Q&A for any, any additional questions. So to get started, you know, what are we talking about when we say a general partner IPO? Um, Essentially, this is another IPO of a sponsor's retained interest in an MLP, um, and we're, we're going to presume for purposes of this, um, of this webinar that, that people are familiar with an MLP and, and with the MLP structure. Um, but so in an, in an MLP structure, you know, the sponsor entity that, that originally created the MLP um, typically owns um, you know, a general partner interest um, and controls the MLP through that interest, um, and then often also has incentive distribution rights or IDRs. Um, and may have other limited partner interests in the MLP itself. And you know, the, what we've seen recently on, you know, in GP Holdco IPOs is that you aren't typically going to have operating assets at that entity. It is really going to be a derivative asset of the MLP that um, provides a way to monetize the, the sponsor's retained interest um, in the MLP but doesn't have separate operating assets. And so, you know, at a very high level, the way it works is you have the MLP, which is, you know, has its own cash distribution policy, um, is going to be distributing um, up to the general partner hold co entity um, the, you know, distributions with respect to its, you know, general partner interest and these other limited partner interests. And then that, the GP hold co will turn around and distribute all the cash that it's receiving from the MLP to its now, you know, new holders. Um, less, of course, any you know, reserves that it might have uh, for some of its own expenses. Um, but again, it's not going to have separate operating assets. Um, and so that would you know, typically happen right around the same time as the distribution that's received from the MLP. And so um, you know, in many ways, the way to think about this is it is a, you know, a derivative security of the MLP. And so when you look at kind of how this structure actually works, if we move to slide five, um, you know, this is you know, at a very high level. and, and Mike will show us some much more detailed and fun tax structuring slides, but at a very high level, this is where you end up. You have 
two different sets of public owners, one at the MLP and one at the GP Hold Co. And the sponsor continues to control both entities. So, um, you know, it has it has the control, and it can, which can happen through various methods um, of the GP Hold Co. And then also continues to control the general partner of the MLP. So even though a portion of the the economic ownership interest in the the GP is sold to the public, they still retain that control. Um, so with with that very high level kind of overview of what a GP Hold Co. looks like. Um, you know, I, I think what we've seen, you know, when we were we worked with several issuers earlier this year doing general partner IPOs, I think probably from the get-go, what we spent the most amount of time thinking about was actually picking a structure. And as you'll see, there's there's a number of different ways that a GP Hold Co. can be structured. And thinking about which one achieves the right goals um, tends to be where we focus a tremendous amount of time. So I will hand over to Mike Bresson to talk about some of the tax <coughs> structuring issues. Sure, and, and the main structuring issue is uh, do you want your public entity to be a partnership or do you want it to be a C corporation? You know, usually in, in the MLP world, we, li we like to think about pass throughs, you don't pay tax at the entity level, but maybe you've got a C corporation, that's what you want to sell to the public. So if you're trying to sell stock of a C corporation that owns a GP interest in the public, um, uh, there, there might be some benefits to that, but there might be tax at the entity level. And then we'll talk about a potential partial solution to that, the so-called uh, up C structure, where at least for a while you can defy gravity and sell a corporation to the public and, uh, and, uh, and not pay taxes. And we'll talk about some of the usual issues, IPO issues for um, uh, uh, in any kind of MLP type entity uh, gain to the sponsor and allocations to the sponsor after, after the IPO. Um, uh, and, and, and you know, a, a big consideration uh, uh, in, in Partnership versus corporation. Why would you even think about taking something you could market as a partnership, make it a corporation, and pay tax at the entity level? It's um, a difference in uh, who your potential shareholder base is. So that's that's one reason people will look at the, the C corporation structure, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So so the three um, uh, the, the, uh, you know, there's there's um, uh, three main tax structures, and then there's also you've got a choice of state law structures. From from a state law point of view, your GP hold code, your public entity, you can set it up as a as a corporation, state law corporation. You can set it up as a limited liability company, or you can set it up as a, as, as a limited partnership. And, and Molly will talk about that um, uh, uh, in, in a little while. On the tax side, you can. Try to um, sell your GP, MLP, your GP hold code just like it was an MLP and a, a traditional MLP GP. Or you can just, as I said, sell a, um, a C corporation stock. Or you can um, uh, uh, do, do the up C structure, which, um, uh, you know, up C, it's uh, short for umbrella partnership corporation, which is, is kind of hard to get any meaning out of that. So the way I think of it is I read it backwards. Not UPC, but CPU. It's a corporation with a partnership underneath, and we'll show a structure to, to show what that uh, what that looks like. So the the, the first structure we're going to look at is a, is, is a GP Hold Co. That, that's taxed as a partnership. So you see the shaded triangle there. That's your GP Hold Co. That's your public entity. It's shaped as a triangle because it because it's a partnership. So you know the wonderful thing about your your MLP is it can be publicly traded and still not be treated as a corporation for tax purposes. So it's uh, so it, so its income is untaxed at the entity level. That qualifying character of the MLP income can pass through up to the general partner. So the general partner can qualify as an MLP just like the um, uh, uh, just like the MLP does, and the analysis is essentially the same because of the pass through character. So when you're thinking about doing a GP MLP IPO as a partnership, the considerations are pretty similar to the to the considerations when when you're doing a, 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 a an MLP to start with. You can uh, um, uh, uh, provide a tax shield on distributions to the um, uh, uh, to your public investors, and you've got to worry about are you going to recognize gain and to what extent at the formation of the partnership. Um, what did I leave out? And uh, you know, your GP MLP will have the same issue as to, as to who the most likely unit holders are as your MLP does, and that is that uh, um, uh, partnership units are very attractive for their pass-through benefits to some investors, but for uh, folks like uh, tax exempts that are subject to the uh, 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 unrelated business tax, 
or foreign investors that might be subject to tax on their on their U.S. source income, or to people who don't who just think K ones are complicated and they don't want to mess with them, it, it, it uh, might be not not such a, a an appealing investment. So that can affect um, uh, who you can sell your your uh, partnership uh, uh, MLP units uh, to. Uh, the second structure is just, uh, um, uh, you, you see we got a shaded box there. We are selling our GP hold code to the public as a corporation. You know, you might, uh, it might be that you, for historical reasons, own your, your, uh, your general partner interest in the MLP through a corporation and you just want to uh, sell the stock of that corporation and that's the most tax efficient thing for you. You, you, get, you get capital gain. And what you have to think about is that if you sell you know, 20% of the stock of that corporation to the public, you're selling a slice of whatever uh, tax liabilities are inside the corporation to the public. So if there's a low basis, low tax basis in the assets of, of the corporation as, as, as MLP interests, uh, GP interests and IDRs will tend to have a relatively low tax basis relative to their value because you've, you've hit a home run. You know, the value of your interest has really exploded and, and, and your basis hasn't necessarily uh, gone up. So there is um, uh, uh, a lot of potential for entity level tax inside the C corporation box. And if you're getting graded by the public on what is the distributable cash flow that you can distribute to me as a, uh, as a public investor, then you, you, know, you start inside the C corporation. And you know, you know, if, it was a, if we did a partnership, we wouldn't really start inside the partnership. We'd say, okay, no tax at the partnership. And all the cash comes out to, the, to, to you the public and you, and you might get a tax shield on it. So there's that you can distribute untaxed cash flows. With a C corporation, if it's got a low tax basis, it might pay a lot of tax. And uh, what it has available for distribution is the cash that's left after it pays its tax liability. So that, that's a trade-off you have to think about if you've got a C corporation that owns your GP uh, uh, and, and IDRs and you're thinking about taking the stock of it public as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to forming a new partnership and, and, and taking that public. And, you know, the beauty of um, uh, an, another benefit of, of selling a stock of a corporation is your tax exempts, your foreign investors, everyone who loves to get the 1099s and get K and not K1s, that's what they'll get if you're just selling the stock of a plain vanilla corporation to the public. Uh, and uh, finally, Let's see here, do I have an explanation of this structure? Let, let, let me do the explanation first here. No, I'll do the picture. I'll do the picture. So I'm going to start at the, um, the, the shaded box. You've got, the, that's your GP Hold Co. And it's your, it's, it's your publicly traded entity. It is a corporation for tax purposes, and, and, you, and you did that on purpose. Okay, but you see that it says it's a limited partnership, and so Molly will talk about the wonderful things about having that be a, a, a limited partnership for tax purposes. But you can elect for or, or for state law purposes, but you can elect for tax purposes to make it a corporation. Okay, so so the asset of of that public GP hold co. Um, uh, let, let, let's maybe I should explain the public GP hold co. The economic interests in it are 100% owned by the public through Class A shares. So if, if you want to sell a 20% slice of your, your, your GP to the um, uh, public, what you're going to do is you're going to put it inside this OPCO triangle that's underneath the shaded box. Take 100% take, take of your GP and MLP interest, put it in the OPCO, then effectively sell, let's say, a 20% slice of OPCO into the, into the uh, GP hold co. The public owns all the stock of GP hold co., but, uh, but since it's a limited partnership, you can own the strings, you can own the general partner interest in that and, and control the GP Hold Co. even though you don't control the economics in it. So the, so the sponsor's retained interest in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the GP is through, its, through a direct 80% uh, interest in the OPCO, and then the public's interest is through a 20% interest in the OPCO, and then the OPCO you see down below there owns the MLP uh, general partner, and if you want it to have units in there, it, it owns the, the, the MLP units as well. And, and the, um, uh, the benefit of this structure is that if you just think, I always think, start with the shaded box. If you, if you think of that GP Hold Co. as uh, going out selling its stock to the public, raising cash, then uh, going to the sponsor and saying, I want to buy 20% of Opco from you, um, uh, and it'll have you know one Opco unit for every 
um, uh, 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 GP Holdco share that it has outstanding, the the, the GP Holdco is going to pay full fair market value for those for those Opco units. So it's going to get the benefit of a stepped up basis and the underlying shares. And it's going to be a fairly high valuation on the assets of the GP Hold Co. Because you're going to go out, you know, a wonderful thing is the, that Nelson will talk about is the low yields at which GP equity can be marketed. So th this is a um, uh, 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 GP Hold Co. is going to have a lot of deductions relative to its income. So you can look out into the future and tell the public that uh, for some time out into the future, we don't expect this entity to pay any any taxes. And so that that's nice <laughs> because. For as long as all those deductions hold out and for as long as you don't pay any tax at the C-Corp level, you've kind of got the best of both worlds. And you're kind of like a traditional MLP. You're distributing untaxed cash flow because we've got enough deductions to, to avoid paying current tax. And uh, since you're a corporation for tax purposes, you can market to um, uh, uh, your, your um, uh, non-traditional MLP investors. And since it's a state law partnership, you can kind of hold that string and, and, and retain control. So that's all wonderful. And, and, you, and you know the the um, uh, uh, what we haven't seen yet is, is with these structures is how people manage things when you get out years in the future, and uh, and it becomes difficult to avoid those C corp level taxes. But you know that you got a long time to plan for that, and and uh, presumably people will, will will figure that out. Um, uh, that's, and I think the only thing I left out. Um, uh, uh, look at this is just a word with the words describing what I just described with a picture is uh, let me go back you see that 80 percent interest that uh, that uh, the sponsor has I'm calling it 80 percent the units in opco um, uh, how does the sponsor get liquidity you, you know it's got a, an interest in a private entity the public entity is up above and so um, uh, what you have built in is a right of the sponsor to swap an, an opco unit for a GP holdco share on a one for one basis that, that's that's built in for, for, from the start. So whenever you want uh, your liquidity, you just go to the GP Hold Co. and say, I'm ready for shares, and then you sell the shares. That'll be a taxable transaction to you when you swap those uh, units for shares, which will be nice for the GP Hold Co. It gets a step up in the basis of those additional units. Triggers tax to you, but you were going to sell anyway the next day, so you don't care. You're going to recognize your, your, your gain anyway. And so if that sounds like... Um, uh, more tax monkey business that you can believe would actually work, but it's um, it's a tried and true structure. It started out the up, you know, this is based on the up C, which is derived from the up REIT, which uh, the IRS has published regulations with an example that says this all works. So this is all designed to work, at, um, pretty, um, uh, you know, without any need to make any sort of hedging statements in the in the marketing materials to say, hey, maybe it, it doesn't work. It's it's tried and true. Um, uh, I got way ahead of myself. So uh, there you go. Um, uh, uh, the, the, you've got both the um, uh, uh, um, all these deductions that the that the uh, that the, the GP Hold Co. that purchased those Opco units has for, from its stepped up basis. They keep it from paying cash taxes. That's a nice story for GP Hold Co. The ability to distribute untaxed cash flows. There's also a nice story that you can tell the public investors in that uh, uh, you know not all distributions from a corporation are taxable as a dividend. They're only taxable to the extent of the current and accumulated earnings and profits of the corporation. Earnings and profits, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a tax concept that's sort of like uh, cumulative, undistributed um, uh, taxable income uh, computed with somewhat slower write-offs. So, you know, because you'll have that great kind of tax shield effect in general, you can also look out and say, you know, I'm not going to have earnings and profits for, for some period. So there will be a period of time when a lot of the investors' distributions are going to be a, a tax-free recovery of their basis and their shares rather than, 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 a, than a dividend and the distribution taxable as a dividend. And even if it is a dividend, you know, dividends are nice. They're taxable at a lower rate. They're taxable at that 20% uh, rate plus, plus the Medicare tax. Tax guys always got to talk about the Medicare tax, you know. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, and then, you, you know, the, um, 
uh, it, it's kind of hard. Uh, whenever you're planning an MLP IPO, there's a lot of neat tricks you, you, could, you can uh, take advantage of under the tax rules and maybe defer a lot of gain. It's a little harder to do with a um, uh, with an MLP GP IPO. You're probably going to pay tax on your IPO proceeds because you've got a, a low basis and not a lot of disguise sale tools at, 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 uh, uh, at your disposal. You've got to um, uh, uh, also keep your eye on a, a, a bizarre issue that there, there's, a, there's a set of rules, the investment partnership rules, that uh, they're designed to keep, say, a mom and pop, um, uh, you, you know, you own a shoe store and you want to cash out and, you, and there's some fund that, ha that owns a lot of public securities and it can go around and acquire these little businesses and you're effectively getting shares of a mutual fund for, for, your, um, uh, uh, for your interest in your business and you're, and you're doing it all tax-free. These investment partnership and investment company rules the, the tax version are designed to, to kill that, but they're written a little too broad so they could actually pick up your, your formation transactions where you're, where you're getting into your, your IPO structure. So that they can, those issues can be avoided with proper planning, but you've got to keep your eye out for that. So that will be something you're, you'll end up talking about if, you, if you're doing one of these transactions. And, um, uh, you, you know, depending on the nature of if you're setting up a, a corporate GP hold co, you, you, you know, there's a whole bottomless pit of issues that you might potentially face. But if you've got, if you've got a, uh, you know, existing C corporation and you just want to sell it, then that's, that, that's pretty simple. You know, you, you recognize a gain on your sale of that, that slice of the, the stock of the corporation. And then uh, last tax slide, you'll be glad to know. Uh, you know, looking forward, and yet forward after the IPO, you know, everybody loves the tax shield. And, and the way the tax shield works for a GP IPO is similar to, to an MLP. You, you, um, uh, 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 if, so if you've done a partnership IPO, then, then the public, you can, you can market to those units to the public on the basis of the tax shield. They'll get on distributions. Um, uh, again, if you, get, if you just take a plain vanilla corporation public, you've got to worry about, you know, you might have a lot of corporate tax leakage at, 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 the, uh, at the entity level unless, you, you know, there's maybe a few tricks you can uh, uh, take advantage of under some circumstances to, to reduce that. Um, uh, say if 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 you if if uh, there's a corporate parent and it retains 80% ownership and it can consolidate and it has NOLs, it's kind of a long story, probably kind of unlikely, but yeah, you know that's that's, that's one possibility. Um, uh, 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 and then and then finally, you know, all all the tax shield issues for the UPC corporation, they're very similar to if you were doing a um, uh, an MLP partnership, but any issues that arise that might potentially um, reduce your shield. Instead of being, hey, maybe that's the public's problem, they won't have quite as much of a shield, it becomes a, a cash tax shield issue. So, so it, it puts all the, the tax, shield calculation, tax shield calculations in a higher profile because now you're talking about cash taxes at the entity level that could reduce your distributable cash flow. And so yeah, you know, an issue that could come up is, uh, hey, do you have um, uh, uh, certain types of, of old goodwill assets that, that are hard to uh, get a tax shield off of and uh, you know that can arise in many cases it doesn't arise in some cases it does just another issue to keep your keep your eyes on okay so we're going to switch back then to thinking about on the the corporate legal side um, some of the the decisions that get made when you're taking a GP hold co public um, not quite as complicated as, as the tax side, um, but there are some differences to be aware of um, in terms of the type of state law entity that the, um, that the GP Hold Co. is organized as. So, you know, a corporation, if you think about it from just a fiduciary duty standpoint and, and the way that you maintain control, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest advantages um, that MLPs, you know, realize is through the, uh, whether you use an LLC or a partnership structure, you have the ability to, to modify um, through contract, the way that your um, fiduciary duties and your um, the way that the control is set up um, for the for the entity, and so you have a, this great amount of freedom there. And, there. and there's a lot of established precedent around uh, what those contracts would look like, and you know, of course, how we've ended up with these very complicated partnership agreements for MLPs. Um, and so, if you chose a corporation as a state law form, you, know, you don't have that freedom. You are you are going to be bound by um, you know under Delaware law. Um, fiduciary duties, and you have less freedom to, to modify those types of things. And from a, a control standpoint, um, you know, a partnership, it's very clear that, you know, when the, the sponsor entity owns the general partner, that they, they're able to, to maintain that control of the partnership. 
whether it's either a corporation or an LLC, that control is is really going to be more through the actual ownership. So, for example, in a corporation, you, know, you need to own more than 50% of the stock to sort of truly have control over certain voting decisions. Um, in an LLC, again, through this you know, ability to modify by contract, you are going to have a little bit more flexibility there uh, where you can create some special voting units and things like that that can replicate the partnership. But um, you know, at the end of the day, the partnership really creates, um, ha has the most flexibility for those types of decisions. Um, in addition, there are some things, um, you know, for example, under the New York Stock Exchange rules, um, and there are certain SEC rules, where there are um, carve-outs or exceptions for limited partnerships that don't apply to other types of entities. So whereas there's a number of you know, common themes between partnerships and LLCs in terms of how they're set up from a state law perspective, when you actually go you know, and look at the, um, the stock exchange and the, the SEC rules, they actually treat LLCs and partnerships differently. Um, and so for you know, I think historical reasons, there are some carve-outs for partnerships that just don't apply to LLCs. So for example, the 20% limit on issuing new stock, um, there is a carve-out you know, where that does not actually apply to partnerships, but it does in fact apply to LLCs. Um, and we've kind of already touched on the fiduciary duty side of things, but so you know, if the GP Holdco is organized as either a limited liability company or a partnership, you continue to have kind of the same um, MLP-like um, uh, partnership agreement provisions. Um, whereas if you if you if it's organized as a corporation, you're going to have uh, the default corporate law fiduciary duties. Um, you know, one thing just to touch on is that you know, a common um, issue that needs to be dealt with at the MLP level are conflicts of interest um, between the parent entity or the sponsor um, and the MLP itself. And um, you still have to address those same issues at the GP Holdco level. Um, there's a little bit less focus on things like drop downs. Um, if you're not going to have actual operating assets that are dropped out into the GP Holdco, you know, you may not have the conflicts. Um, Issue come up as often, uh, but it's something that the you know you need to be aware of that that's still that's still something that needs to be resolved um, as between the sponsor entity and then the now public holders of the GP Holdco. Um, and then just a few other kind of governance topics, you know, comparing corporations, LLCs, and partnerships. Um, again, there are certain exemptions that partnerships have um, under the securities laws. So, for example, they're not required to have compensation committees or nominating corporate governance committees. Um, you know, whereas in order for a corporation or an LLC to, to receive that same treatment, it needs to be a controlled company, which, um, you know, essentially is going to be, um, again, going back to the ownership level. So you have to strictly own a certain percentage of stock um, to control through that methodology, whereas, again, through the partnership, you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and then another one that's, that's come up on the issuers that we've worked with that I think is really important um, to them is not having to have, you know, an annual meeting and proxy statement requirements. Um, that's, that's a specific exemption that limited partnerships have. Uh, they're not required to have annual meetings. Um, you know, they, the stockholders or the public unit holders are not electing the board of directors. Um, and so that's you know, one less public company requirement um, that they have to deal with. So I think for a lot of reasons, the, the limited partnership um, format from a state law perspective has a lot of advantages. Um, and so being able to preserve that limited partnership format up at the GP Holdco uh, I think is attractive to a lot of people who are considering this structure. And then as Mike mentioned, you, you have some flexibility there to decide, do you want to be taxed as a partnership or taxed as a corporation? And the state law entity choice doesn't preclude you from picking one or the other. Um, I know Mike mentioned you know, sort of the tax investment company or investment partnership um, considerations. There's a separate um, and confusingly named um, Investment Company Act consideration on the corporate side, um, which is, you know, a common issue that MLPs deal with is making sure that they're not going to uh, be required to register as an investment company under the Investment Company Act of 1940. Um, and you know, in order to do that, they structure the MLPs in a way to make sure that they have um, have control over the operating subsidiaries that are actually operating their assets. Um, and so, there's a number of ways to structure around that. Um, certainly, the ownership of a general partner is a very uh, well-established way to to demonstrate that you have control regardless of what your economic interests are. But in some of these structures, as you saw, you know, sometimes the economic interests are not going to be exactly aligned with where the control is. And so we always have to keep the Investment Company Act considerations in mind um, so that we continue to preserve the right type of control um, you know, within the economic and the tax structure um, that actually you know, achieves the, the sponsor's goals. And then the last topic I wanted to cover just on the legal side is um, 
uh, you know, as a securities lawyer, you can't talk about potential IPOs without talking about gun jumping. Um, and I think there's some unique issues for general partner IPOs, um, in part because you already, you know, by definition, you already have a public company. And so you are selling securities um, of, that are interest in an existing public company. Um, and so thinking about that, you know, as, you know, if, if this topic comes up and you start planning for a potential IPO, um, you know, gun jumping is one of those things that needs to be at the, at the forefront um, of those considerations, you know, from the very beginning. Um, so at a very high level, um, gun jumping it refers to the restriction under Section 5 of the Securities Act um, that you cannot publicly offer securities before a registration statement has been filed. And so, you know, we're focused a lot on um, not conditioning the market and, um, and prohibiting written offers that are outside of what the securities laws consider to be, you know, a proper prospectus, which will not actually get filed until you're all the way down the road in your process where you're ready to launch your roadshow. And so during that whole planning process and then, you know, the, even at the time when you filed, um, and particularly if you file confidentially, there's going to be, you know, this information out there about, about getting ready for this IPO. And you need to think about the, uh, you know, potential traps around uh, your existing public company. So, for example, um, you have um, any communications that are about the MLP could also be considered, you know, conditioning the market or sales materials really for this potential GP hold code that's about to go public. And so that could also bring in things like research reports by investment banks. So if you have an investment bank that's been engaged on a GP hold co, you know, they oftentimes will have to stop um, publishing research on, uh, on the underlying MLP. Um, and, and those are sort of considerations you have to kind of talk through and, and make sure that your, you know, your everyday communications on the MLP are not going to rise to, you know, a gun jumping issue for a GP hold co. Um, and then, you know, also just keeping in mind that the, the IPO itself, you know, is likely, or the potential IPO up at the general partner is likely to be material non-public information for the MLP. So to the extent the MLP is looking to access the capital markets or do transactions during the process while this um, GP Holdco uh, registration statement is on file, you know, that's an important consideration for the, the securities lawyers and the, um, and the company to consider um, so you make sure that you're not, not running afoul of, of any gun jumping rules that way. But of course, it's not you know not intended to in any way stop the MLP from releasing its its regular business information. It doesn't stop you from doing your you know your press releases and your earnings releases in the ordinary course. You know the and the important part is that you continue doing it in the same manner and with the same scope as you have in the past, and that you're not trying to to put a spin on it or put an angle on it that now suddenly focuses on the value of your general partner. That's I think where you know you could potentially have a, a trap there. So with that, we will hand it over to Nelson to talk a little bit about what some of the GP Hold Co. precedent looks like and, and what some valuation considerations are. Thank you. So we've talked about the three types of structure. There's the plain vanilla corporation, the UPC, which is kind of a mix in between, and the limited partnership. Then we've also talked about what that means for taxes, how you think about governance and regulations. And the last part of that is how we think about from an investment banking side on the marketing, on the valuation, and on the timing. And so as an issuer, that's, ultimately it's a big grid. It says, okay, I have to choose one of these three structures, and then I have to think about, based on those three structures, how important is taxes versus governance and control and the regulatory side of that, and then how do I maximize my evaluation in a current mar market? So what I want to do in these few pages is talk about, okay, you understand theoretically how, what, are the, what are my options. What have the last six GPIPOs chosen? And we can talk about either why they chose them or what it's meant for them. Um, so page 23, we have six laid out. We have Targa, Kinder Morgan, Western, Plains All-American, Tallgrass, and EQT, and they've ranged in timing from 2010 up to about three months ago. You'll see in the top row, and I'm going to go down the row, uh, two of them are C-Corps. Those are the first two done. Then there were two limited partnerships, which would have been MLP formats, and two in the UPC structure, so the it's a LP format for the owner, for the parents, so they maintain the governance, but from an investor, they're still receiving a 1099 in these UPC structures. You can see in the next row the size, the transaction size. An important consideration is as you get into the larger size in the $2 billion plus range, previously the precedents will show that these issues have chosen more towards the C Corp route. As Mike alluded to, it's a broader investor base. There are certain investors that will like a 1099 but will not like a K1. And so on the larger size, that becomes more of a consideration when it becomes thinking about what is my access to capital. 
The next point I want to bring up is on the asset mix. Molly, when she started, she said a lot of these IPOs, uh, GP IPOs, are only the limited and general partner interest. And that's true with the exception of Kinder Morgan that had a small piece of NGL pipe, NGPL pipeline in there. That's a consideration because what it does is if you're a sponsor and you still have assets up top at the C Corp, it doesn't mean you need to put all those remaining midstream assets, as an example, into this entity. You still can maintain control of the midstream assets and can have uh, full optionality as it relates to where those assets go, if it's a tr future drop down or elsewhere, but then only uh, monetize your ownership in the general partner and limited partner interests. Uh, we find a lot of sponsors like that for optionality. It allows them to say, okay, I have complete control of what I want to do with my assets because they're important to me and it's probably important to the broad entity, but then I also want to raise capital through this retained interest that I own um, through the GP and LP interests. The governance slash control, as we've discussed, the, the nice part of the GP IPOs as it relates to structuring is if it's important to maintain control in a situation where the, the parent sponsor says, I want to raise capital, but I don't, I don't want to give up certain governance rights whereby someone, an activist, could get in there and start monkeying with my stock. There are certain things, and that's something you work more with your law firm about. Uh, the taxes, another consideration we spend a lot of time on. Um, in the LP, it'll still be a pass-through. That'll be in a perpetuity. In the UPC, um, that's something you'd work more with your tax accountants. But what we found is at certain valuations, given the step up, there can be a considerable period over time whereby this entity, the new UPC created, is not paying taxes or paying very limited taxes. And so that period could go 10 years or longer. It's something you don't work with your tax accountants on, but as you model it out, um, there is a considerable step up in basis that what happens is it becomes a return of capital rather than a return on capital, and that's, that's the more detailed tax question. Uh, the last part is timing, and I can talk about that uh, in further detail, but the question is, after I do my MLP IPO, when is the right time to do a GP IPO? The considerations there, just like, and we'll get into this further, with evaluation, you have to con take into account where is the GP in its life cycle, because as, as we model out GPs, as you know, with the IDRs, those cash flows grow incrementally over time. And so maybe in the first year, the GP is not receiving much cash flow, but then by year five, six, seven, it could be a considerable amount. And so that's something that you'll want to work with your investment bank on trying to figure out when is the ideal time based on what your forecast looks like. And that's how investors will think about it. Page 24, I want to spend a bit on where the precedents were as it relates to their split level. And so when I refer to split level, I'm referring to the IDR split level. Uh, most MLPs are structured with the 2, 15, 25, 50% split level. You'll see all the precedents were in the highest tier. The next row shows the percentage of cash flows paid to the GP IDR. So this is the MLP of the total cash distributed, what portion was going to the GP IDR. So while they may, in the fi may be in the 50% splits, only 20% of cash flow was going there. And I put that number because I think it's relevant uh, to think about where that MLP was in its life cycle. All MLPs may be in the 50% splits, even though, as you can see from the second row, that number as far as at the life cycle of where they are can vary pretty dramatically. The third row, we put um, what the NTM is the next 12 months cash flows. This is, these numbers are all at IPO, so these are from the S1 prospectuses. Uh, you can see at a minimum, it's around $100 million of actual cash flow to be distributed. The, that's something you want to work with your investment bank on of how much cash goes in and what is the mix between LP and GP cash flows. Um, it's relevant because if you're either too small on a total dollar amount of cash flows or too heavily weighted towards LP cash flows, that may be less appealing to certain investors. Uh, the next comment is the percentage of GP hold code cash flows. So of this entity you're, that's actually going public, what portion is GP cash flows versus LP cash flows? The reason why that matters is LP cash flows grow at a slower rate than GP cash flows. And so as an investor, they're looking forward to figure out what does my growth look like. And so that's a mix that at least previously you can see what other um, peers have done. And then a question we get a lot is, can I put debt at this entity? Uh, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, from an investor's perspective, they look at debt on the, the total family. So you can have debt at this entity just like you would have a debt at an MLP IPO. That's something you'd want to work further with uh, your banks and accountants on. 
I'm going to go to page 25. What we've done here is this is an indicative MLP that we made up that said, if we went public on January 1st, 2016, what do the cash flows look like? And this goes back to this question of timing and trying to figure out as, as a sponsor, as an issuer, when is the right time? And so what we show, and I'm going to start with the bar charts, the dark bar, bar charts, the black bar charts, those are the GPIDR cash flows over time. And so you'll see in the beginning, in the early stages of an MLP IPO, there's virtually zero cash flows there. It's, you know, 2% GP, there's not much there. But there's a pretty quick ramp up. In four years, you go from zero to $9, in this situation, $9 million a quarter, which is going to be uh, whatever that CAGR is. It's going to be 50-plus percent. The bar above that, the dark gray bar, is going to be your LP cash flows. As we discussed earlier, most previously issuers have put in LP <laughs> cash flows as well. Um, what it does, it allows them to monetize both their GP and LP cash flows so they can raise more proceeds, but also slows down the growth of this entity. And that's what goes to the line chart above, and you can see the percentages. What those percentages represent is a forward growth rate at that point. So if I took Q1-16, it's a 19%. So if I go Q1-16 to Q1-19, what is the forward growth rate of those cash flows? What you'll see is the numbers go up over time, and then they start coming back down. The reason is the IDR cash flows. IDR cash flows ramp up. And then once they hit the 50%, they start to slow down. There's still a big ramp, but that's what you'll see as it relates to a, any, most MLPs when you model them out on a four basis. This is how they lay out. And what you'll find then is, at least previously, most MLPs have targeted the 50% splits. And you can see at the bottom, we've laid out the quarters being public, where the split level of this indicative MLP is, and where the cash flows that this entity is receiving. We'd recommend you work with your investment bank on exactly how many LP units go in and what the timing looks like. This is just an indicative chart to think about it as because each issuer is different. I'm going to flip, flip to slide 26. The question comes up, well, how do I value this entity? Is it any different than I value an MLP? So we think about an MLP. An MLP is the current distribution, so a yield, plus there's growth on top of that going forward. That's the same valuation that we approach from a GP. You say, okay, what is this entity? What kind of cash, as an investor, what kind of cash flows can I receive now? What would I expect those cash flows to be over a forward period, let's call it three to four years? And then as a result, how do I think about valuation? Um, you can look at it from a current yield. You can look at it on GP multiples. And so if you say the total entity is worth a billion dollars, I'm going to back out the value of the LP units. And what does that mean on purely GP only valuation? Um, and then you can say, okay, what does that mean on a IRR? And so if I invest now, I get cash flows and I exit. Those methods are all the same as it relates to an MLP valuation. The second part of that is now because there's a public MLP marker out there, in there a way that an investor could use the valuation of the public entity to, to impute some valuation of the private entity, and there is. There are certainly ways you can look at relative distribution yields, you can look at the total value of the entity, EBITDA multiples. That's something you'd work with your investment bank because there's a slew of, of ways to, th to cut the data differently. The point is the valuation isn't that different from the way you think of an MLP and that's how investors approach it. What I'd like to spend a minute uh, uh, about is what is this S1 and how do I think about the document? The what happens is the, the S1 that you create for a GP IPO is very similar to what you create for an MLP IPO. And when I think about it from a valuation perspective, it has a forecast, and so you'll have a one-year forecast. Now, that forecast typically takes a slightly different format than what you would see in an MLP, but it's still a forecast, and uh, every issue is, is approached that differently. But there's a forecast just like you see in an MLP. Um, there is no MQD, and so because the GP IPO, a lot of questions we get is, well, can my GP hold co have subordinated units and IDRs just like my MLP does? That's never been done in the past. We recommend having a traditional structure where there are there is no MQD and subordinated units, but you still would have some sort of distribution from your forecast of what would be expected to be paid at a minimum. Um, as Molly mentioned earlier, I think the last thing I'd say is because this entity only has GP units and LP units, there's real, there's no maintenance capex or could be interest. But the cash flow paid out is usually all of the cash available. There's, you don't need to really retain any cash. Maybe in one quarter you would, but 
from a longer period, you pay out all your cash flow because this entity is purely a derivative of the underlying MLP. And so without holding assets, coverage is less relevant. You think of coverage as kind of your buffer. You may have that on the asset level that's less relevant as to think about the general partner. I'm going to flip to slide 27. Um, what we've tried to do here is lay out certain uh, considera considerations and issues as you think about an issue or saying, do I want to do this or do I not? And so this is a list we put together, and I'll walk through it, but it, it certainly uh, hopefully will be a catalyst for questions. Um, the advantage of doing a GP IPO, a GP hold co IPO, um, issuers say it's allowed them to monetize their current interest in what they re retain in this MLP and the GP units and the LP units, and so they can raise capital. And in the future, it gives them a vehicle to sell down further if they choose to. And so if they said, I need capital, this is a great way to do it. You already have a public vehicle. It's much easier to sell securities in already a public vehicle versus being private and saying, suddenly, I need capital. It's a much longer process than if you're already public. Um, some issuers see this as an additional current or additional vehicle for M&A. So now they have an MLP and they have a GP, and both of those units can be used by the sponsor as a vehicle for M&A that otherwise, as a private entity, may be less likely. Um, some sponsors have seen it as an IPO, just like any IPO, could be an eventual catalyst for a spin of that entity. So it could be an IPO and then a spin down the road. You're not required to do that, but that could be an option. Um, I think it's important to point out, as we said earlier, you don't lose control of this entity. So while you can raise proceeds, you can use it as a vehicle for M&A and eventual spin, you still have full control of it. And that's very important to a lot of our issuer clients that say, I like the entity, I, I like the benefits, but I it's having maintaining control is very important to me. Uh, and finally, uh, using this vehicle as, as a means to highlight value. You have this, if a sponsor has an entity and this GP may be worth a lot, but the research analysts for whatever reason are not picking up on that valuation, this is a good way to get a public marker. Uh, I'll point out a few things as it relates to why you may not want to do this that we hear. Um, the first is it complicates the story. If the issuer is public, there may be a public C Corp, and now you have an MLP and a third GP. and so. You create incremental, um, it's a burden on the entity now to have three public vehicles, and it may not be necessary. Um, the, the MLP and the sponsor may already have accomplished their goals of liquidity and access to capital through the MLP, and so they may say, well, why do I do this? If I think about it, I have already already have a great public vehicle in the MLP that has a low cost of capital, and I can raise the amount of money I need. It's not necessary. Um, and the third is, as relates to that, if it's not necessary, there is incremental cost that relates to doing um, an IPO. There could be the cost up front as it relates to legal costs. There's ongoing costs. You'll have to do a second, a separate 10K and 10Q. There'll be ongoing filings. What we find, just for reference, is that the process to do a GP IPO is typically shorter than the uh, MLP IPO because the documents are already created. You already have a public vehicle. Um, and the ongoing accounting, while there is an incremental cost, uh, it's, con it's typically consolidation counting. And so, a lot of the financials are mostly there. They'll still have to be audited. But let's stop there. That's that's what we had as far as prepared remarks. Thank you, Nelson. Um, and this is the point in time in the presentation when I'll give this quick public service announcement about any attorneys that are participating uh, via the webinar. Um, you would need to use uh, the following code um, in order to get the appropriate CLE credit. So the code is 58492. And I'll say that a couple more times, uh, 58492. Uh, and we'll repeat it one last time, uh, 58492. So with that, um, we are happy to answer any questions um, that may have come in either through the webinar or that those of you that are attending in person might have. I got one for Mike. Ha ha. Two parts. I knew there was an undertake <laughs> in this. Can you give just like literally a 50,000 foot overview? I guess that two, it's two questions are unrelated, but a 50,000 foot overview on tax exempts and why they have feelings about partnership versus corporate tax. Um, and then the other question, just totally unrelated, is, is in this subsea structure, I, I, I was used to kind of the, the, one of the fundamental features of the FC structure being one of the tax allocation agreements. And then I didn't see that kind of in the diagrams. Is that something you don't typically see in the MLP FC structure? And if so, why? Thank you. 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 Thank you
Okay, there are, there are two questions for those of you um, uh, 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 out, on, out on the phone. One is um, uh, how do tax exempts think about uh, investment in corporations versus, versus partnerships? What are the issues there? And the other is uh, you say UPC and I think uh, tax distribution agreement. Do we have one of those here? So, so the first question, I mean, imagine a world where a tax exempt entity could go out and buy an interest in a partnership that was conducting a business, and um, uh, 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 yeah, you know, th and that's a world where the tax exempts would take over the world because uh, no tax would ever be paid by the business. So that's the most tax efficient structure. And so, um, when this became started to become apparent in the '60s, Congress enacted the Unrelated Business Income Tax, which says, um, uh, "Okay, fine, tax exempts, you can own, you can earn capital gains on stock." You can earn dividend income, but uh, and, and you can earn certain kinds of uh, you can earn own interest in partnerships that engage in certain kind of unlevered uh, real property investments. But in general, if you are uh, an investor in a business partnership, we're going to tax you like you were a taxable um, uh, investor. So some tax exempts, you know, if they like the partnership idea, they might invest through their own blocker corporation, or if they don't want that compliance burden or that's not how they think about the world financially, they might just shy away from those kinds of investments uh, uh, at all. So if, if you're out there selling um, uh, ju just a, a standard MLP type pass-through unit, then the tax exempt has some thinking to do about how it's, it's going to own that or whether it needs to take a pass or, or, or wants a different kind of vehicle. Um, uh, uh, up C, you know, you know I, I have to fight. I, I like to say uh, when, when I'm describing this, the, 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 the UPC type structure, I'd like to call it the yield code type structure, but that blows people's minds because yield code, they think, um, uh, renewables and it's not renewable. But, yeah, yeah, you know, the UPC, uh, classic UPC takes uh, advantage of the fact that um, uh, uh, since the uh, corporation is not going is, is to pay the sponsors for the step up that, that it's getting in the IPO, corporation gets a step up in the IPO. Um, uh, but uh, it doesn't get any real evaluation benefit from that, and so the sponsor says, "Fine, pay me. You got to step up, um, uh, and it's worth nothing, nothing to you. Pay me the cash value of the step up over time as you enjoy it." And so up sees, um, uh, uh, and, and so they're, you know they're, they're, they don't they don't try to distribute distributable cash flow, so they're not graded on their cash flows. They're graded on their earnings, and that doesn't hit their earnings. So that cash that goes out under the tax distribution agreement makes the sponsors happy. And uh, since since the since the corporation claims that that it, it uh, doesn't care about the step up, then it shouldn't care about the loss of the benefit of the step up. And that uh, that works great in that world where you're graded on earnings. But when we enter the uh, the the MLP type world, you're not graded on earnings. You're graded on distributable cash flow. And if you're taking some of your distributable cash flow from your step up, I mean that's basically what you have to sell is your step up and the fact that you're distributing untaxed cash flow. So if you're effectively paying tax under a tax distribution agreement, you're fighting your model of distributing untaxed cash flow. So you don't so you don't want to do it. Any other questions? Molly, I bet is that um, the whole code would not qualify as an emerging loan company the affiliated status with the public MLP. So the question is whether the hold co, the GP hold co, would qualify as an emerging growth company because of its affiliated status. So it's going to be separately considered whether it's an emerging growth company or not. Um, and so kind of depending on the facts and circumstances for each sponsor entity, you have to take a look to see if they do actually qualify as an emerging growth company. Um, but they don't, they aren't de facto um, removed from the ability to be an emerging growth company as a GP hold co. Maybe. So, so maybe, maybe is the answer. <laughs> I love details. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of these structures we've seen, um, the number of units at OPCO is equivalent to the Class B plus the Class A that's shares that are kind of held by the public and the sponsor. Um, so two more questions. The question is, um, can those diverge so that they don't have to be equal any longer? And then second question is, are there tax why you would or would not want to make a difference. Sure, I'll, I'll repeat the question for the folks on, on the phone. 
the, the question is that um, uh, when you're looking at the UPSI or yield co type structure, if if you count up all the uh, all the all the shares that are outstanding in in the um, uh, in, in the public EPSI vehicle and all the units that are outstanding in the the OPCO, they all add up to the same. And 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 what's up with that? Uh, and was there a second part to that? Yeah, this, are there tax reasons why that is the case, or why you could diverge or could you diverge? Right. No, no. It's all just it's all just basically uh, uh, economic uh, scorekeeping. You know, if, let's say you've got. Um, uh, uh, a business in, that you're putting in into the structure, and your opco is going to divide it up into 100 units. So there's 100 equal units of economic ownership, and you're going to sell 20 of those units to, to, to the to the C corporation. So um, the C corporation is going to go out, going to go out and raise um, uh, cash equal to the value of 20 units, and it's going to pay that to, to the sponsor. And so for every, as you point out, for every um, uh, 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 that corporation has 20 shares outstanding. It's going to own 20 units, and uh, and th and that is on purpose, and 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 it's and it's uh, and, it, and it and it's designed to track the ability of the sponsor to take its 80 direct opco units and eventually someday perhaps swap them for uh, for for 80 shares. So you want that one for one economic uh, correspondence so people can can keep track of what they own. If if and if that. If that gets thrown off, I, I would say the wheels come off the wagon. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I mean, but I mean, it's just it's just fundamental to the to the structure. And then, sorry, one more question, um, unless other people chime in. But marketing issues aside, in terms of broader investor base um, and potential core currency for acquisition, if given the choice between an up structure or an MLP structure, for tax reasons. Is it fair to say that typically you would choose an MLP structure over an FC, uh, barring kind of other marketing issues, or is that, is that too, too simple? Okay. Uh, the, the, qu the question is, um, uh, how in the world can you as a tax lawyer stand there and put somebody inside of a C corporation, right, when they could do the, the deal as not a, a, a um, uh, a C corporation, and that and that is you know that that's the basic bias of a tax lawyer. You know, Baker Botts would say, "Friends don't let friends put assets in corporations. <laughs> corporations are like roach motels; the assets go in, they don't come out." So, so general rule: no, we don't like corporations. We don't like to put assets in corporations. So, um, uh, but but this 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 uh, up C type yield co structure, it's uh, it's unique for a couple of reasons because of that. The very low yields at which the, you, you market the equity that implies a very high value for the assets relative to income. So that creates, as Nelson mentioned, the ability to go for a long, to divide gravity for a long time, be a C corporation, and not pay tax for a long time. Still goes against the tax lawyer grain because someday you're going to have to pay tax. You know, you know, so you'd like to stay outside that world. But there's a trade-off, and that is, um, uh, um, as a corporation, you can go out and market your uh, equity in a different market, and so. Um, uh, that's what you're playing for. You, you, you know, if, if you can if you can be a corporation and not pay tax at the any level for you, you know 10 or 15 years, um, uh, uh, you know, to an investor today, that's that feels like forever. And if you can get a much broader um, uh, base, and that actually helps you out in in, in, in some way, then uh, uh, th then that's a consideration. But but certainly, my knee jerk bias is 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 always. Um, uh, uh, we like uh, we like partnerships. Any other questions? Andrew, did we have any come in? Okay, I think we've all been answered. Well, thanks again, everybody, for for joining us either here in person or over the webinar. Um, we look forward to to speaking to you again soon in an upcoming corporate series. And and thanks for joining us. Thank you. All.